This series is a collection of webinars that um, are highly yield topics given by a wide variety of healthcare professionals and experts like Dr. Karim Kiyumi. Uh, today's session is the third one. So after learning about the basic theories behind education and learning, and also exploring competency-based education, today we are continuing our learning journey and exploring what's behind curriculum development. Uh, Dr. Karim will walk us through the definition and history, curriculum views, components of a curriculum, and curriculum design. Uh, Dr. Kayu, uh, Karim Kayumi uh, has more than 50 years of teaching experience and is an award-winning innovator, entrepreneur, and teacher. He has received many accomplishments as a director and researcher and a cardiovascular surgeon. He's the founder and director of the Center of Excellence of Simulation Education and Innovation at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Karim, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, should I start my sharing my slides? Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Sad, for uh, your introduction. Uh, I would like to um, uh, also thank all my colleagues and friends for uh, supporting this lecture series. Um, and uh, I hope uh, uh, we will learn from each other um, and uh, make the medical education a better uh, event for all of us. So as um, Saad mentioned, um, uh, in the first lecture, we uh, talked about uh, theories uh, behind uh, education and particularly medical education. And then in the second lecture, we talked about um, competency-based education and how it applies to medical education, particularly in Canada. Uh, today, we are gonna talk a little bit more about the curriculum development. So um, by the end of uh, this presentation, you will be familiar with um, definitions and history of uh, curriculum, um, curriculum views, um, components of a curriculum, and how those components relate to uh, curriculum design. Um, I, I'm sure you will understand that to cover all these topics in depth, would not be possible within one hour, but I can um, barely be able to scratch the surface of these issues. So um, the first issue would be about the definition of, of curriculum. Uh, when you go to the literature and you talk to people, um, at times it's very confusing because people have different views and different understanding of what curriculum is. Some people think that curriculum is a body of knowledge. Somebody thinks that curriculum is a menu of opportunities. Some others think that curriculum is the content of a course. What some people think that it's a guide uh, for the education process. And some others may think that um, it's a vehicle or a program in which a school achieves um, its purposes and objectives and goals. Um, I would say all of the above <laughs> is correct in, in certain ways. And uh, we can just go to the history and see how these curriculum views come, come about and why they're all correct. And in the meantime, what the modern understanding of a curriculum concept is. So um, to start uh, the word, uh, Curriculum is coming from the Latin uh, verb to cur. To cur means to run and, and signifies an action of running or a course of action, a race. And um, it was used mainly, um, uh, the, the word curriculum was used in um, uh, ancient Greece and, and Roman Empire uh, when they did the the, the competition for chariots to go around the stadium. And when the chariots complete a circle, 
and in a stadium and come back to the same point again, uh, they call that a curriculum. And then when they, do, when they do the second round, they could two curriculum, two sec, three curriculum, four curriculum, and so on. So um, that's where the, the, the word is coming from. Um, but the, the, the word curriculum, the first time was used by John Franklin Buffett in um, eight, 1918 um, for uh, education. So uh, actually, uh, Bubbitt did a, not only introduce the word curriculum to education, but also he uh, made a revolution, a cultural shift in education. Because uh, before that, uh, education was a teacher-centered event. And the teacher was the ultimate uh, decision maker uh, and, and the teacher will come to the classroom one day and right there you would make a de decision whether he's gonna talk about this subject or another subject or would take the students to the lab or, or, or give them assignments or whatever. So the teacher was the ultimate decision maker and it was a teacher-centered education. Now, uh, what Bobbitt said is that learning is a plan and guided process we have to specify in advance what uh, we are seeking to achieve and how uh, we are going to uh, go about it. So what it means is that he uh, proposed to um, make the uh, education process an organized process, which was before unorganized, and also to make it, to take it from teacher-centered to student-centered education. But nobody paid attention to Babbitt, unfortunately, uh, up until 1949. Why? Is because he was trying to promote a cultural shift and it was not in the best interest of every teacher who had all the freedom to do whatever they want. And now suddenly they have to define what they're gonna to do today, what they're gonna to do tomorrow and how it's organized and how it's assessed. So um, in, in uh, uh, Taylor in 1949, um, brought the, the, the concept of the curriculum from Bobbitt's work um, into life. Um, and uh, as you remember, um, last uh, uh, lecture, we talked about the uh, uh, Sputnik revolution and, and all that in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I mentioned to you, you should remember that because it's a very important date. So this is a time when, when the concept of the curriculum become more and more um, in, into education processes in universities and schools and everywhere else. So um, at this point, um, uh, people like, like Taylor and John Kerr, um, they uh, identified specific issues and say a curriculum should have a goal and should, uh, we should know what, the exper what experiences the students should have, how to achieve those goals. And, and also we have to determine in the end whether the goals are achieved or not. So, um, so that's very brief about the, 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 the word curriculum where it's coming from and, and who actually brought that into uh, the education and how it was developed um, in the 60s and 70s. Now we're gonna talk about the curriculum views that signifies why there are so many different understanding and expression of what curriculum is in the definition of curriculum. The curriculum views are related to the uh, Aristotle view of knowledge. Aristotle categorized knowledge into three disciplines. The theoretical, which is called theoria, the productive, which is called poesis, and the practical, which is called uh, praxis. So in relation to these um, views of knowledge, uh, people have designed uh, views of the curriculum. So there are four uh, curriculum views uh, at this point. One is the curriculum, people, some people uh, view curriculum as a body of knowledge with relates to theoretical. 
Some people think curriculum is an attempt to achieve the outcome, which is relates to productive. And some people that curriculum um, is the education process, is what's happening in the classroom. And some other people think that it's much larger than the classroom. Curriculum as a process um, thinks about practical deliberation of education in, in, in the entire system. So now we're gonna go uh, and scratch the surface of each of these views of curriculum. So if people who have used curriculum as a body of knowledge, they think curriculum is syllabus. They, 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 uh, they, they think the word curriculum is um, synonymous to uh, syllabus. And syllabus actually um, is also coming from Greek word in, it means a concise statement on uh, content of a treaty or subject of a lecture or series of headings and notes. So it does not actually reflect the whole concept of the curriculum because if you look at the concept of the modern curriculum, it has six important components. Component one is the needs assessment. Component two is learning objectives. Component three is content or syllabus. Component four is um, the methods of delivery, how we're gonna deliver this knowledge. And, and component five is assessment and uh, six is evaluation. So looking into the modern concept of a curriculum, uh, syllabus would not make it because syllabus is just one part of the whole entire concept of modern curriculum. But people who looks at curriculum as a body of knowledge, what they do is they, they put objectives and contents as a most important value. They put value more on the content and objectives of the content. But they don't think that um, implementation uh, of, of the content, which the education process is that important. The second, uh, View, people who views curriculum as an uh, attempt to achieve outcome, which we call it also productive. Um, these are the vocational uh, skill uh, people. Um, and and you, if you remember, we talked about this again in the previous lecture uh, about vocationalism in competency-based education in the 60s and 70s because of that Sputnik revolution. And, um, what it, it entails that education is seen as a technical exercise. So uh, that in, in this uh, view that objectives uh, must be set, a plan must be uh, made, and then um, the plan should be applied and the outcome should be measured. So it covers most of the things that a modern curriculum is proposing. However, if you look at the highlights of of the curriculum as a product, um, we can see that yes, it is systemic. Um, it, it, ha put, uh, it has an incredible organization power. Um, it's also the, the objectives are behavioral and um, the outcomes are measured and it's very organized and the results are evaluated in the end. So, so it looks like it's a very good uh, method. However, there are some shortfalls and this method of curriculum as a product. And the shortfall will include mainly that a plan or, or you know, a, a program assumes great importance. So once you made your plan, then you cannot move out of that plan. You have to stick with that plan. So what it, what it does, it does two very bad things to education. One is that it kills creativity. So, um, and you, the, the teacher cannot say anything more than it was written in the plan. Uh, the students cannot think, interact and action in the classrooms are not taking anymore, and there is no room for innovation. So, and, and also uh, because of this uh, greater importance of plan, um, we are overlooking the opportunities that may arise during uh, a session, a process of teaching. And also uh, we have to understand that it's um, the education uh, process 
in this system of curriculum as product, um, you know, is, is, is not important. They don't pay attention into the educational process. And the nature of the objectives are mostly psychomotor. So that's why it was used very successfully in vocationalism, in vocational schools. So the third view of the curriculum is curriculum as a process. So what's the process of education? In the process of education, there are three important issues, uh, components that interact cons consistently with, e with each other. It's the teacher, student, and knowledge. These are the three most important components in the process of teaching. So this view of curriculum believes that curriculum is what's happening in the classroom because the interaction between the teacher and the students and in, in, in the accessibility of knowledge based on this um, process of, of learning is more important than anything else. So uh, it, it has good size because it improves critical thinking in the, in, the, in the classroom, the students can say whatever they want and they ask whatever the question want, they go out of the box that the teacher would, would go and, and, and do whatever he can uh, to support uh, the education of that product as a whole, not specific to that learning objective. And encourages interaction in the classroom um, and uh, continuously uh, it's evaluated. So the, the, the curriculum as a product was evaluated only in the end to see if we achieve the learning objectives, but curriculum as a process, it's a constant um, evaluation of students as we go through the education process. So these are the, the good things about the curriculum view as a process. Um, and the fourth um, uh, um, view is very similar to the third view as uh, curriculum as a process or, or practical deliberation. It's concentrating on the process of learning in teaching. And in this process, they believe Yes, teacher, student, uh, in knowledge, interaction are very, very important. But they bring new questions and they're asking very simple questions. Yes, these three factors are important, but if a student has an empty stomach and angry and a poor student uh, versus in the classroom versus a student who is rich and had caviar <laughs> in butter in the morning, would, would they learn the same? Would, they, would, they, would that have the same opportunity of interaction and learning? And also the, the gender, uh, are we equal to male and female? I have to tell you in, in medicine for a long time, we have not been. I remember the times when we did um, uh, an evaluation and assessment of the OR in relation to the women surgeons. And we found that, um, or environment, or table, or instruments, um, everything is made for a six foot tall, big man. They're not made for a, for a woman. And when you, when you go there, and, you, and, and if um, a, a, a teet, um, uh, very smart and bright uh, woman doctor would like to have a pedestal to climb, even the nurses would laugh at, at her, you know? So, so pe pe it's very uncomfortable. We found, our research found this actually published that it's very uncomfortable environment um, uh, for, for, for females. So, so what it says that, yeah, that the economy, the relationships, what, what, when the student goes out of the school uh, and one student goes and works for another eight hours, <clears throat> very hard work, and the other student goes and into his home and sleeps. And after that, a tutor is coming and teaching him, would that, would, that, would that be the same environment? No. So what they're saying is that all these other factors that affect, um, that affects education should be part of the education process. So they add milieu into the teacher, student, knowledge milieu into the education process. And actually, Philip Jackson <coughs> called milieu a hidden curriculum that we don't see it, but it's there. The effect is there, and we should take into consideration this. 
So uh, curriculum as a process, um, um, mainly it is um, thinking about collective human well-being and they put uh, the emancipation of the human spirit in the center of the curriculum. So if you um, just uh, go into the movements uh, of, uh, for education that was formed in North America, in they, were, they are very much related to this curriculum views. So people who view curriculum as a body of the knowledge, uh, the movement is that the liberal educators. The people who view curriculum as a product, uh, the, the, the movement is the scientific curriculum makers. The, the curriculum as a process is the developmental and uh, person-centered uh, educators uh, movement. And the movement for process is the millerist, um, people who think in social justice and, and freedom of mankind. <clears throat> so now that we know a little bit about the history and also we know about the views of the curriculum, we can uh, jump into the components of a curriculum and how would that affect the design of the curriculum? So as I mentioned before, <clears throat> the, the components of the modern curriculum includes needs assessment, learning objectives, content or syllabus, methods of delivery, assessment, and evaluation. So we're gonna go into every one of those and, and see how we can organize that to make a better curriculum for yourself. However, we have to understand now that learning objective is the most important part of a modern curriculum because everything else is connected to that in circles back to that. And that's why it's called curriculum because um, like for example, needs assessment defines the, what learning objectives should be. But when we go to content, content has to reflect the learning objectives. Methods of delivery has to be related to learning objectives. Assessment has to be ref reflected by learning objectives and the evaluation, ev evaluations will, should be also affect the learning objectives. So in the end, once the evaluation of a course of a, of a session is done, this evaluation would go back, completing a circle like, like running chariots in a stadium and, and giving feedback to learning objectives and, and needs assessment to adjust that uh, consistently and continuously. So um, looking at the, uh, at the component one as a needs assessment, um, needs assessments, you all know about needs assessment and you know how to do needs assessment and surveys or, um, or, or interviews and use dolphins or other methods to, um, um, to, to identify specifics and so on. But um, the most important thing that uh, you have to know here is that you don't have to do a needs assessment for developing your curriculum when your curriculum is already part of the medical school curriculum because medical school has done already that needs assessment and they know specifics. So uh, specifics of learning objectives. So we start um, right from learning objectives. Um, but if you haven't, if, if it's not part of your uh, medical school curriculum is something extra that um, extracurricular or extra that you uh, that you come up with ideas and, and innovative ideas. Then you have to do a needs assessment to see uh, whether it's needed to deliver this knowledge, or if it's needed, um, what would be the, the most important learning objectives. So, but the learning objective, the second component, as I said, is the most important. So by definition, um, uh, agreed by many authors, um, that uh, learning objective is a clear statement to describe the knowledge, behavior, or components, or competencies that students uh, should possess uh, upon completion of a unit of education. But when we are talking about learning objectives, we should take into consideration three important components when you're making your curriculum, when you're developing your own curriculum. One is to, to, to see that your curriculum is a student-centered, so it's not teacher-centered. Um, two, that your learning objective is um, uh, reflected 
the domain of learning. And then the third one is that your learning objective reflects, reflects the level of, of learning on each domain. Um, it's important to, 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 to consider these things because when you do your learning um, objectives and you say by the end of this uh, session, uh, uh, students will learn this or that, not I will teach that and that. So it has to be not teacher-centered, student-centered. And with respect to the uh, domains, um, in the level of domains, we can talk a little bit more. So you know perhaps all, it, it's very simple uh, concept that everybody knows about the educational domain. There are three, three main educational domains, is cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. So cognitive is more about knowledge, affective is more about values, and, 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 and psychomotor is more about doing things. So, but each, when you identify that in your learning objectives, that your learning objective is about cognitive, affective, or psychomotor. And if you, once you identify that, then you have to identify in which level you, your students would, which level would they reach after the completion of your se session or your course or your rotation. So um, for that, we, we use taxonomies. There are many, many taxonomies out there for, for these purposes, uh, but the balloon tax taxonomy seems to be uh, agreeable with, with a lot of educators. And uh, what, with respect to Bloom's taxonomies, we have at least six different steps or levels of uh, learning uh, in, in cognitive uh, domain of, of education. The first level is perhaps uh, just knowledge to memorize things and recall uh, information. And then the second one is comprehension. So you have to, do you understand the concept and can you say it back with your own words? And the third one is the application. Can you apply the knowledge you receive into solving problems? The third one is analysis. Can you analyze uh, in, in compartmentalize all the information you receive from um, your teacher? And uh, the next level is that once you compartmentalize it and analyze it, can you synthesize it back? And can you make anything new out of it? And also, can you evaluate? So the highest level would be evaluation. So when you do your learning objectives, you have to mention, if it's, if it's a cognitive domain, you have to mention this by the end of this um, rotation, the students would comprehend or uh, analyze or synthesize, so on and so forth. With respect to the effective, um, you know, Bloom's taxonomy have, has five levels. Um, receiving information, um, and, and if students are paying attention when they receive information, uh, or, or, or they have respect for that information. And if it, in the second level, um, they're, they're, uh, do they respond to that actively? Uh, in, do they value it in the second, next level? Uh, do, you, do they use that? Um, in, in the organization of their daily life and prioritize that value over other values. And then the last one is that um, uh, this, this value is already internalized with the student or not. Um, so it become a routine in his life or, or he still has to work hard to make it a routine for his life. So when you have the effective um, uh, domain, your learning objectives should mention um, on which level uh, your students in the end of this rotation would reach. And the last one is psychomotor. If you have a psychomotor, for psychomotor you have even more than uh, six uh, levels, um, but it's too complicated, but to simplify it for you, if you remember in our first lecture, we, we, we talked about the stage of transfer of learning by Chan. So Chan as the orientation coaching, tuning, and routinization in mastery. So it, it, this, this is exactly very close to that. You have to make sure that you would um, say in your learning objectives, uh, which level of psychomotor your student would reach by the end of this session or by the end of this rotation or course. The third component is syllabus. 
So syllabus is actually the, the information and the subject matter. It's the information um, uh, to be learned um, in this particular school. It is a compendium or, or um, uh, you know, com complex uh, facts, um, you know, concepts, general knowledge, principles, theories, and things like that. But what's important, like how you deliver that knowledge, in what kind of knowledge you should deliver to the students. When you're developing your curriculum, the most important thing is to, to think whether you're going to do subject center um, or you do the learner center. So if, if you're the subject um, uh, center view uh, of the curriculum content is um, when you start talking uh, about the general lecture for a general public and you start from, we, like we do now, we start from history and coming to uh, more precise issues and things like that because it's very general understanding. But when you are teaching something precise with the specific learning objectives uh, that your school wants you to, to teach your students, then it's better to do a, a learner center because you have a group of specific group of learners that to, to bring specific knowledge to them. They're not interested in the history. They're not interested in the concept. They're interested in how to do things, how to do the knot tying, how to do the suturing, or how to do the, the um, you know, uh, internal jugular vein, cut central, you know, so many competencies that you're talking about or any other things, uh, cognitive or, or affective uh, domain. So you have to make sure that for learner centered, you give a precise information that uh, reflects, uh, reflects your learning objectives, uh, but not in general information, where in uh, subject centers, you have to talk about, about more about general information. Uh, it's also very important when you're making your, your subject matter uh, to make sure that it's um, self-sufficient. Uh, you, you don't want your students to, to leave your uh, lectures or your, your content that you're providing and go to the internet, go somewhere else to find, to define, to understand. So it has to be self-sufficient and also has to have a significance. Significance means that it, it should reflect the learning objectives. You're not gonna talk about other things, just learning objectives. And you have to make sure that your information is valid um, and it's evidence-based and it's also, it's utilizable and it's learnable because a lot of times we're talking about things that students may not be able to learn. Uh, so uh, it has to be, uh, have that utility and learnability and visibility, it's visible to learn. Like, like if you're teaching something um, in, in, uh, in, 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 at UBC here, but I go and teach something back in Afghanistan or some other countries, um, they, things that I have here in my hand to support my curriculum, they may not have. So you, the, the education objectives that you're making and the content relating to that objective should be very visible and it should have continuity. So um, component four uh, is uh, methods of delivery. So how do you wanna deliver now that you have the learning objective, you have the content, now how you're gonna deliver that? For that, you have three important pillars to consider when you do your uh, curriculum development. One is the educational psychology that we talked about in the first lecture. You have to know what you're de delivering in which domain, in which domain you have to know which educational psychology would be applying to. And then, you know, you remember that, you know, that the, the uh, uh, behaviorism, cognitivism, uh, you know, uh, constructivism, um, uh, andragogy, and, and all others. Now, um, the second important pillar uh, for your methodology is task analysis. It is so important to do task analysis in different levels, and I will talk about that to you. And, um, uh, and, and also to, to have a good instructional design. So for task analysis, uh, you have to use task analysis in several different uh, uh, ways. One way to do is to, uh, to uh, develop your curriculum. So do you have your milestones and you have your competency uh, domains and then you have competencies. 
and then and then you have uh, EPAs, right? So we talked about those things. So that is for the content for for for, for your learning. But also, it's important to do task analysis uh, in within your curriculum to deliver it properly. So in this task analysis, you have to look into the learner, teacher, and the environment. So the, le the learner task analysis for the learner, what it means is that you have to identify a specifics. Uh, what a learner sh should do to reach your learning objectives. You have to have a clear statements of what a learner should do to reach the learning objectives. What a teacher should do to reach the learning objectives. And what kind of environment do you need to reach the learning objectives? So these three things are extremely important to identify from the beginning, then you would have a very successful methods of delivery and and the students will enjoy your 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 class very much and be very informative um i'm not going to talk about uh i think task analysis a lot because uh, I, I did talk i do remember now i'm an old man if i did this last time but task, task task analysis based on scientific management theory of frederick taylor and he was an industrialist not a a, a physician not a, an educator he didn't have even a phd but but what, what, what he was a smart man, but he was losing everyday money in, in the production of his company or his, his factories. So he analyzed and he thought we should have analyzed every task and divide it into a smaller denominator and smaller and smaller up to the point we, we get it to the bottom denominators. And then each of those bottom denominators called entry points or entry behaviors and those entry behaviors, then he assigned a person to do that. So when, when the production was less, then he would know whose fault is that. But in, in the 80s and 90s, um, the, the task analysis and scientific management theory is widely used in, uh, in education. So we should do the same thing of having our, um, our, our uh, major task, uh, which, which you call EPAs, uh, bring it to smaller, uh, you know, units, uh, uh, which is domains uh, of competency, and then smaller, which is competencies, and smaller, which is milestones. So this kind of task analysis is very important for for uh, uh, to to, make, to develop a curriculum. So the last uh, important point that I mentioned is um, the the instructional design. So instructional design is, um, uh, again, um, it's, it, it has a three important uh, pillar. So, so instructional design identifies the methodology, educational methodology, the content and the learner as the three important um, pillars of, 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 of instructional design. But lately we have now technology that becoming very important in education. So we have now the fourth pillar uh, th th that is technology. So we have now methodology, content, uh, the learner, and, and the technology. So when we do the instructional design, we should um, understand that if we are using the adult, adult learning theories, what kind of technology we should use for this? Is this uh, adaptive hyper uh, media or or uh, cyber uh, patient or whatever other things are. If we are saying a uh, theory of multiple intelligences, do we use um, uh, you know, different technologies? If we are using the uh, constructive, uh, constructivism theory of, of uh, Piaget, then uh, maybe simulation technology, physical simulation is the best technology. So when you design and you identify in your design the methods, then you, that psychological, psychometric, or, or, or educational psychology um, uh, theories, uh, you should match that with a specific technology and match that with your content and also match that with your learner groups, who they are and what you teach. It's important here to also mention uh, that the education in North America, in fact, in the whole world, 
um, is suffering because of one issue. It's the um, discrepancy between efficiency and innovation. So in North America at this point, uh, as you see in, in this one here, um, if you have the, um, uh, edu if you plot the education versus uh, if efficacy versus innovation, the in in the power of innovation and efficacy is uh, is uh, exactly the same. This adaptation corridor is is wide and is going up very nicely. So what it means that efficiency means examine, 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 make sure that they know, make sure that they not know this and know that and so on. So our system is based mostly on examinations. And when we don't leave uh, much room for the students to be innovative, you remember when we do, when we do, uh, when I teach surgery, you teach uh, some other things uh, in the OR and then um, a student tried to not hide differently or switch it differently. They say, don't do that, don't do that. Who taught you that? No, 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 do it the way exactly I do. So what it means that we're killing the innovative um, aspects of education where we're not allowing the students to, to self-explore, you remember, according to Piaget. But so in the whole education environment in North America in particular, our education is more skewed skewed toward efficiency than to innovation. Um, it is very good uh, in one way is that students would learn, we would know exactly that they learn, it's very efficient, right? So we know what they learn and, but they may learn everything we taught them, but when they, when, if they are, they, if we not allow them to be innovative, when they go into the real world, they're gonna fail because they cannot apply their knowledge into different situations and instances. But if we gave them the opportunity during medical school, even during kindergarten, during K to 12, and during university and, and so on, if we gave them the opportunity to be innovative also, and we have, we have to have efficiency, I'm not saying we should not have efficiency, but if we gave also opportunity for innovation, we will make them ready for life. And as you remember, uh, the last thing when you develop your curriculum, your milestones, your, your competencies, your competency domains and your APAs and so on, then you have to make sure that, that you use the system-based theories that we talked about and, uh, you know, uh, last time, and I don't want to uh, elaborate on this, uh, of, you know, on the, in the interest of time today. The component five of the curriculum is about assessment. So most of the time we have um, summative assessments and informative assessment. So summative assessment is the, uh, the end point assessment. So the end of the semester, the end of the rotation assessment of the teacher who has a lot of weight because we tell them whether they fail or, or pass. But which is formative assessment um, late, lately become the most important assessment because you catch all the shortfalls of the student during the rotation or during the semester, and you help them, give them feedback to support and support them in different ways to reach the learning objectives. And in the end, you're gonna have a, a much better crowd of, of students passing your courses than, than, than failing in learning things. So um, there are um, different methodologies, I'm not gonna, uh, perhaps um, talk about those very much because it's, it would take uh, another lecture. Uh, and perhaps you all know that your assessment, you, you, we can categorize them in a system of knowledge and a system of performance. So with respect to the attendant assessment of knowledge, you can choose whatever you want. You can choose a multiple choice questions, key features questions and assays and so on and so forth. But for the performance um, assessment, you can um, use a checklist, you can use the rating scale, you can use uh, structured, uh, structured objective clinical examination, which is ASCII. Um, in short cases, you can do 360 evaluation, you can do a million, many clinical um, uh, evaluation exercises or many sexes, what we call. So you can use any of those in your curriculum, it will be okay. It's just to make sure that, that these, that the methods of 
assessment that you're choosing um, reflects your learning objectives. So, so you, because in the end, why you're assessing, you're assessing because you wanna know whether your student reach your learning objectives. Evaluation is, is another issue. Evaluation is mostly, um, mostly done to improve the quality and, and effectiveness in the value of the program uh, or the teacher or the product that you're, that you're developing. So in there are different type of um, evaluation. There's self-evaluation, there's reflection, there's um, teacher evaluation when the, when the teacher evaluates students, student evaluation when the student evaluates the teacher, peer evaluation when the teacher uh, evaluates the teacher or student evaluates the students, course evaluation, and also the whole entire program evaluation. Uh, but also it's important to, uh, uh, to, to take uh, into consideration that CIPP is continuous improvement performance. Uh, this, is, this is the model um, so that, that, that closes that circle of curriculum from evaluation back into the learning objectives. So the continuous evaluation would make the, the system better and better and better in each circle. So um, at this point, I think um, uh, we have uh, reached our learning objectives, um, which was to define the history. Uh, we did that. We talked about where the word curriculum is coming from and how it is applied um, uh, in, in, in how Baba can put that into, into, into uh, the, the concept in, into the system of education. We, we, we talked about the curriculum views and uh, why the curriculum, the four curriculum views are related to uh, Aristotelian um, um, thinking of, of uh, uh, knowledge, you know, the kind of knowledge that he was um, identifying. And um, we know about the components of the curriculum. We talked about those important components and talk about also curriculum design a little bit. At this point, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and um, I hope um, we um, had a good exchange. Please uh, let me know if you have any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Kiyumi, as always, very inspiring and thoughtful presentation. Uh, presentation. Uh, we already have some question flooding the chat box. Uh, I just invite everyone to use the Q&A functionality so we can keep track of the question. Uh, so yeah, this question from uh, Shakufa, uh, what is the difference between assessment and evaluation? So assessment is the um, uh, e evaluation of students for their knowledge. Evaluation is mostly used uh, not for appraising the student, it's used to improve the system, it's for feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question, the second question by Sulafa, how do you suggest we incorporate soft skills such as communication skills, empathy, and dealing with conflicts into the medical curriculum? That's part of the effective domain. So, uh, so when, you, when you're thinking of, about those things, you do apply all the other issues that we talked about but on the effective domain. So it goes under the effective domain. But still, if you have soft skills, it doesn't matter. You still have to have learning objectives. You still have to have, um, uh, you know, uh, methods of delivery. Um, you still, you have to have evaluation and, uh, and assessment of the students. For example, um, if you are, doing communication, for example, delivering a bad news. So you have to know uh, what, what would be the, your objectives um, on delivering the news and how you're gonna do that with SPs, with, with, with cyber patient, with, with a real patient, uh, uh, you know, and, and what's your expectation and how you're gonna evaluate your student on that. Are you gonna use the ASCIs? So, 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 so that, or, or you're gonna ask questions and we're gonna have an interview. So you have to make all those things in your curriculum design. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we also have one uh, uh, another question about this time about the cyber patient platform. So the question is: uh, Is cyber patient based on a like a specific curricula? Um, oh, <laughs> well, that's that, that's a very good question. Uh, <coughs> no, cyber patient is based on educational philosophies but it's not based on any curricula. Think of cyber patient as an, as an educational environment. Think of, think of it as a, as a virtual hospital with you know, 130, 40, whatever there is now, um, uh, digitally enhanced patients that are available there for you to practice. This the, a cyber patient could be included into, into any curriculum, any part of the curriculum. It says, um, let's, or, or you can think of it like as a extra electronic book <laughs> that teach you practical medicine. But cyber patient is based on, um, on the uh, uh, constructivism theory of Piaget and Vygotsky, social constructivism. It's based on um, uh, transfer of learning theory uh, uh, of things and cognitive transfer of learning theories and adult theory of learning. So those are the, the, the psycho, uh, psycho, psycho, educational psychology theories that cyber patient is based on. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this was like a perfect, this is how I try also to, when I'm talking about cyber patient is just to think about it like an actual hospital, but with more benefits because it's running 24 seven and you have, ethical access to virtual patients anytime. Um, and, no, and, and, no, and, no, and no ethical or legal problems. <laughs> you can kill cyber patients 10 times and reboot the computers, fine, you know, just go again to it. But, but you don't have that luxury of making mistakes. People learn from the mistakes. Um, also, cyber patient is very good for drilling, not only for so what, what we believe that when you use cyber patient, um, it condenses the experience of a doctor, maybe five year experience of a doctor within one year or half a year. Why? Because as a, like, as a surgeon, like I, for me to do like uh, cardiac surgery to make patients ready for it, uh, patients are waiting for months. Uh, to do different analysis, different tasks, blah, 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 waiting for uh, all kinds of you know uh, scans and so on and so forth. So when the when the uh, and and how many patients do I see? Maybe uh, maybe 20, 30 patients, uh, you know, a month, maybe 50 in the most. And how many do I operate? Maybe two or three or four in a in a in a week. But what with with cyber patient? you have the opportunity to go within 15 minutes to half an hour through, through the whole experience. And each time you go through that experience, you, uh, you, your, uh, your, your memory gets improved and better and getting better and better and better. So you kind of gaining experience much faster without being cons having concern about uh, about the costs, about um, ethical issues uh, in, in waiting for this or that, uh, administrative problems and so on. Therefore, it condenses the experience of a physician into a very short period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaid. Uh, this is also a very nice question uh, and it always creates some confusion in the the minds of students and educators, what's the difference between outcomes, objectives, and aims? Uh, outcome? Objectives and aims. Oh, objectives and aims. I think we need to have another <laughs> lecture to talk about this in detail. So um, objectives, aims, and goals are used um, interchangeably. Um, people don't pay much attention. But objective is the overall achievement of something, which is the aim is the end point. So when you're aiming, so you're defining your end point, where objective is like um, 
the same endpoint, but it's not just the endpoint, it's much larger than the endpoint. Your objective is more like, um, um, uh, you know, uh, you, you, your, your objective would be to um, learn, uh, you know, not time techniques, but your aim would be to, to uh, achieve one-handed and achieve then two-handed. And so those are your specific aims. So aims are more specific part of in, uh, uh, an objective, if, if roughly, you know. And the goals are much bigger. The goals are like, oh. <laughs> yeah, and the vision is also the overall like long-term utopic goal. <laughs> The vision, the vision is most mostly like a direction. Uh, it's it's um, it has to be time bound, you know. Like this is what we in it is um, ideological. It's yeah. not pra it's not practical. So, but my goal my goal is more like practical. The, the vision is like okay. My vision is to um, you know change the world. Five, mil five million students um, using cyber patient in the next five years, but whether they are cheated or not, it's not. It's my vision that they're going to do that, but but uh, but it's ideological, and it's time bound. Thank you. Uh, also, we will take this last question and maybe another one if you wish, uh, and this also jo joining to the, the both episodes. So, how many assessments are adequate per semester? And this is also joining the learning theories uh, episode. How many assessments are adequate per semester? Well, I, I think um, it depends like what kind of assessment you have. I believe at least um, one formative assessment is required, at least one. If you have two formative assessments, would be wonderful. The more you have formative assessments, the better it is. However, um, it is time consuming. Summative assessments are very time consuming. Like if I have a rotation for a month for a student and I have every week a summative assessment to give the student the feedback and say, hey, hey, you cannot do this. You don't do that, you do this, do that. This one. So then, then I would know, and then if I am organized enough that for each week I have a specific learning objectives, so every assessment would be around that learning objectives, and and in the end of the rotation, then um, I, I, would, I, would, I am much more confident that my student reached the level. However, the summative assessments are once, only once in the end of the semester cannot be two or three, it's only once in the end of the semester. So again, coming back to cyber patient, I think cyber patient could be an, a very important tool um, if the students would, would be in a rotation and they're using cyber patient, uh, the teacher from distance uh, could, uh, could uh, see their um, dashboard of their students and they could, uh, uh, seamlessly and very um, with a, with a, with a, with within half an hour she can go through it and she would find out where the weakness of the student is and she can can give uh, her uh, uh, a message that instantly the student would receive that message that here is my problems so with cyber patient you can do actually four or even more um, uh, uh, formative assessments while in real life you cannot do more than one formative assessment in a one month long um, uh, uh, rotation. The, the reason is, is that it's time consuming, manpower demanding, and uh, you know, it's take you out of the service. It's, it's, it's a, there's a lot of logistics and administrative problems. I hope I, 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 I answered the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Karim. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that we will be having that uh, open space session and in January we are still figuring out uh, the timing but if you watch out your emails you will receive an invitation to participate in it and it will be the opportunity for you to merge the knowledge from all these sessions these four uh, episodes and also to ask these questions um, 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Karim, again for your knowledge and your expertise and also uh, all the inspiration. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, the recording will be available to all who registered once the series is completed. Um, and we will also invite you at the end to uh, complete the survey. Uh, we are really looking forward to seeing you uh, next uh, session. It's on Thursday, uh, on, uh, on, it's on next Thursday, so Thursday 16th of uh, December at the same time. Uh, thank you again and have a nice day or evening. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you.